Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome the co-founders of Green Sun Medical and the Whisper Brace, uh, the CEO, Jamie Haggard, and the Chief Technology Officer, Matt Thompson. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. For having us, I'm very excited to talk about this uh, next generation of bracing and dynamic bracing, the Whisper Brace. Can you guys perhaps give us a little bit of background on how you guys teamed up and what motivated you to, to go in this direction with a dynamic, a true dynamic brace for scoliosis? Yeah, I, I would say we've met over 20 years ago. Um, I used to be on the Yosemite National Park Rescue Team, the climbing team there, and uh, we had a close mutual friend. So long before we thought about being partners in a company, we were climbing and hanging a thousand feet off the ground. And if if you want to get into a company with somebody, you better be able to trust them. And when somebody's got their life literally in, in, your, in their hands, uh, you know you can go into business with them and handle anything. So we started with that. And then uh, eventually Matt, was an, he was already a brilliant engineer and he got into spine and started seeing these adolescent uh, fusion surgeries. He said there had to be a better way. And uh, he had some brilliant ideas. And I'll let him talk about his background on that. But we, we started as, as climbing partners and eventually became business partners. Yeah, fortunately, we're, we're better at uh, building a brace than we are at climbing. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, I had a background in uh, biomechanical engineering. Um, and when I met Jamie, um, we were climbing buddies for a while. And then I was looking for sort of a new uh, direction in life. And he actually got me into sales for a little while in spinal implants. And so I was sitting there watching a, a big, huge fusion surgery for scoliosis, you know, like, uh, you know, occiput to sacrum pretty much. And I was like, wow, why are we doing this? This is, you know, you know, I, my background, my, my dad was actually a biomechanical engineer before they had the words biomechanical engineer. And he was working at a place in, well, he was a faculty at Louisiana State University. And one of his big projects was at Carville, Louisiana, which was a, a leprosarium. Uh, it was a place where people with Hansen's disease would end up and, and live. And those people get deformities of the hands and feet quite commonly. And he would work with, uh, it was a team of engineers and surgeons who would work together to try and make lives better for these patients. And he was telling me when I was a kid about how he was doing all of this stuff to reverse these deformities in these patients. And I was like, why are we doing this in scoliosis? You know? And so in my naivete, I thought like it was gonna be totally easy and I would just go apply these concepts. And it turns out it's really hard. And so <laughs> we've been on this path together, Jamie and I, uh, um, ever since then, kind of plugging away at the problem. Okay, well, those are great stories. And you can't be that bad at uh, climbing because you survived, right? <laughs> well, we, survived. We, were not, we were safe climbers. We were not good climbers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if we go into scoliosis bracing, uh, the evolution is basically starting off with kind of a Boston type brace where it's very symmetrical. Then you move, which is uh, on my left here and more of a recently more into the uh, e-rotation asymmetric uh, braces like the Riga Chanel. Uh, these are my son's braces. And, uh, so they do have a different functionality for sure. What are the ideas that you wanted to incorporate it into the whisper brace? That's a great question. When you look at bracing and the biomechanics of bracing, what you're really doing is you're pushing on the outside of the body with some pads and you're trying to push in a way that's going to make the spine go straighter. And so, you know, the Boston brace does that. It, it kind of typically does it in more of a three-point bend. So if you're looking at just a, an AP, you've got, you know, you've got a three-point bend where you're trying to straighten out the curve. And so that's what a Boston brace is doing. And with a Rigo Cheneau, you're looking more at the three-dimensional aspects of scoliosis. It's a complicated curve most of the time. You have some thoracic rotation and maybe some rotation in the lumbar vertebra. And so it's applying sort of the same concept of, hey, we're pushing on the outside of the body, trying to get the spine straight, but it's doing it in a much more clever way to address the, the real three-dimensional nature of the deformity that's there. And what we're doing really isn't very different from that when you think about it that way. We're pushing on the outside of the body, trying to get the spine to go straight. Um, we're doing it, you know, the, the concept of a dynamic brace and, you know, when I say dynamic, I mean, it's, it's flexible. 
um, it doesn't actually adapt, you know, live to to patient input. And um, but what we're doing is we're making a flexible brace. And the reasoning behind that was, if you look at reversing deformity in other places of the human body, um, like the work that my dad was doing, they were putting constant pressure on you know, digits like the fingers to, to reverse flexion contractures. And so keeping just a small force over a long amount of time was reversing those deformities. And you look at orthodontic deformity, so braces, which almost every kid gets these days. Braces work by applying a constant force. But when you think about the history of, of scoliosis bracing, it's kind of similar to Invisalign in that you've got this rigid thing you're putting on to try and affect the change in the body, but we're only giving them the first Invisalign tray and we're not keeping going. So you get a little bit of correction and then you know the force stops. And that was sort of the whole uh, concept that we were going for. We don't want the force to stop. We want it to keep going. And we did that by offering a flexible brace design. So when you have something that's very flexible, when you get a little bit of correction, the force drops off a little bit. And in theory, you're going to get more correction out of a brace that is flexible than you would out of a rigid brace. Why don't we dive into that? Because that's pretty interesting. So you're saying that if you have a brace, some kind of construct designed to pull, that put pressure on a, a particular area with movement, that's more efficient, more effective than a than a brace that is just rigid? That, that's the theory. So if you look at something called the force deflection curve, that means, you know, if, if, you, if you have a brick wall, your force deflection curve looks like a line that goes straight up because you can deflect and deflect and deflect. And as soon as you hit the wall, the force will go really, really high and you won't deflect at all. And so if you have something that's flexible, the force deflection curve looks more like a line that's sort of gently going up. And so you can actually, you know, if you look at a rigid brace as being completely rigid, you're going to get this force on the patient and the body's going to adapt. And what you think about when, you, when, when you're talking about tissue remodeling is there's sort of a sweet spot of force to affect a change in the body. And above that, sort of above the sweet spot, you're going to get inflammation and pain and, and lesions and things like that. And below the sweet spot, nothing's going to happen. You're, you've got a force there, but the body's not going to adapt to it. You're sort of below the threshold. And so if you put a rigid brace on a patient, their body's going to adapt until the point where it falls just below that sweet spot. And so if you use something with a, a flatter force displacement curve, you can get more displacement before you fall below that, that sweet spot. So in theory, you're gonna get uh, the potential for a lot more correction if you've got a flexible brace that is elastic, that, that is doing the right things with your force displacement curve. And, and if you think about orthodontics, you get an adjustment on your orthodontics and it hurts for a little bit, right? But after a couple of weeks, it's no longer hurting where your body has responded to that and it's no longer putting corrective pressure. It's once that force starts to fall off, it's just stabilizing. And so you don't get more corrective pressure until you go back to the orthodontist and they tweak it up a little bit more or you get another Invisalign tray. We're trying to continue that process uh, because of the spring-loaded mechanisms in our brace and it's gonna continually apply that pressure. And I'd say also, as they come in for follow-up visits, Matt's designed tool sets in that, that we can keep modifying the brace just like an orthodontist would and, and keep easily make a little bit of an adjustment and apply more pressure to help correct the curve. Well, I, I have heard from orthodontists, orthotists, not orthodontists, that, um, you know, ideally they would love to, uh, you know, build a new brace every three months. Right. For as long as need be, right? But it's just not practical. And is that a, is that, a part of the whisper brace functionality in terms of you guys can make the adjustments or do you have to get a whole new brace or is it components you can plug in? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, right now the forces on the, on the body are generated by 
some springs, some elastic elements. And so just by adjusting those springs, you can increase your force on a pad. And so, you know, instead of having to, with a rigid brace, you, you have a limited amount of adjustment you can do where you can make a pad thicker, and then you've got to build a whole new brace. And so instead of building a whole new brace, we just make a quick adjustment to ours. And obviously if, if the patient grows or, you know, has some, some larger changes, then we can certainly adapt, uh, you know, swapping out a few parts here and there. We're not starting over from zero and throwing, you know, the old brace in the garbage can and starting over from scratch. It's a, a minimal amount of effort to adapt to the patient over time. So, you know, the theory is that we're going to get a, a, a lot better um, correction by sort of making those adjustments. And it's, it's reasonable to do now because we don't have to start over from scratch. We've done all the hard work. Kind if of you look at the, the brace, Derek, it's, it's a, a, we build a custom brace for each kid, but it's from standard modular parts. And there's different angles for each of these pieces. So we can keep it, uh, we can make the initial one custom for the, the patient. We can grow with it. And we have little things that can extend and, and grow with the patient. And if their ribs get bigger, we can also switch out some parts to make the rings uh, still be confor uh, conformed to exactly what their rib cage is. Jamie, just uh, this is a, um, do you guys have a brace with you at all that you can show or? I do right here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use that then. Maybe you can. <laughs> it's good to show. So, okay. um, so perhaps just talk a little bit about um, component parts and how it moves, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and Matt, I'll maybe let you describe and I'll be uh, uh, the, the model here. On, on yeah, if you, could, if you could point to the springs. Right. So if you look on the side here, one of the springs, actually, if you look at this one and see how it's pushing this way on the, on the patient. The, that brace, if Jamie, you hold it like straight up like an AP, you can see that that brace is, is there's some significant displacement there. Right. And you're, you're pushing on that thoracic pad over to patient, towards patient left. And so you can, you can, Jamie, if you want to point to that spring just under your right hand there, is it left hand? I don't remember if we invert on Zoom, <laughs> but you, the spring over on the thoracic pad. Oh, uh, over yeah. Here. So, yeah. So if you see that spring, if you want to push more on the thoracic pad, you put more bend in that spring. And so that would be an adjustment that would provide more force. And then, Jamie, if you want to show the, the actuators, there are these little things that look like shock absorbers there. So those actually set the distance between those rings, and the rings are where the pads are. So if the patient grew, we can change the height of those actuators and basically accommodate the growth of the patient. And then, you know, all of the ring parts, if you look at those, um, those are a series of modules. It's kind of like a Lego set. You build up a brace. And so if the patient has some anatomy changes, if they, if they put on some weight, you know, with, with growth, you can just pop out the modules, put in some different modules and, and accommodate that growth too. So there's a lot of ways that this brace is flexible to accommodate, you know, changes in the patient from growth, as well as just being able to provide some more force if you want more force. So we tried to design it to be really flexible and accommodate everything. Um, as, a, as a parent of a child who went through this, I don't know if you, if you just you know, shelled out for a, a Rigo Chanel brace and then you know, over the next two or three months, your, your son grew three or four inches and it looks like you know, a miniature brace on him. It's, it's gotta be pretty frustrating because you know he needs a new brace. You know you've got to adapt to his change in anatomy and we're trying to do that to kind of accommodate for that. Sure, and uh, just to give you an idea, what this is kind of a, they call it modified Boston, and you know what I kind of look for in a brace these days. Once you go through the whole experience, is uh, you know it's very symmetrical, so it's real, really just a core set. And as you know, you're just compressing from all angles equally. So to me, it doesn't really make sense that it's you know the curves in scoliosis are asymmetric. So why isn't the brace asymmetric, right? Uh, and with the Rigo Chanel here, you can see how it's very similar to uh, the whisper brace in terms of it's trying to derotate. 
Uh, so it makes sense to have an asymmetric brace for an asymmetric curve, right? Yes. Uh, and I guess the question is as well, um, with your pad rotation, how do you know where to put the pads uh, compared, I guess with the Rigo Chanel, they'll put pads basically based upon you know, the x-rays, you do, you do a similar process or is there some kind of software that you use to, to do all that? That's a really great question. And, and I think that the answer is different, you know, depending on now and where we want to head in the future. So currently we're working with orthotists to place the pads effectively. So we're relying on their expertise and we're learning a lot as we go along, but these orthotists, that's what they do for a living and, and they're really good at it. Um, and then, you know, so right now, hey, it's the orthodist saying we need a pad right here and we need a pad right here. And that's awesome. And we can place those pads there. And then any forces and pressures on the pads we want to get, we can make the adjustments in the clinic. You know, we prepare for it as best we can, but it's all adjustable. Um, in the future, we want to work with a finite element model that will predict the correction you get from the brace. And so when we build a brace, we want to sort of optimize it and make sure we're getting a great result every single time. And before we put the brace on the patient, we've simulated it, we've predicted it, we've optimized the design, we've got all the pads in the right place, and we've got all those springs bent in just the right way to optimize it for correction and for comfort. And so that's where we want to be down the road. We've, uh, we've made some significant strides working towards that, but we're not quite there yet. For now, it's orthodox skill that's getting across to the finish line. Yeah, Jamie, quick question for you. I like to use like the fact that you use the Invisalign analogy, right? right? And you know, they also kind of project into the future. So you, can you talk a little bit about um, what you see using that type of technology and prediction and how accurate that is going to be? Yeah. Um what we see in the future, like what we have and what Matt has built right now is is pretty incredible. And that's what we're going to market with. We just see that in the future as far as having it pre-designed, pre-loaded, and it will lower the fitting times. So we're still fitting patients the same way and, and the same amount of times as, as an orthotist is right now. We're trying to have it set where that, that experience of getting a brace fitted for you is lowered. And so it's preloaded, it's set. And instead of trying to play uh, a little bit like every orthotist does and seeing how much pressure we're putting on there and do we have to go back and make some adjustments, we should be able to do that out of the gate and make minimal adjustments as soon as it goes on the patient. It would be interesting too, to have a bit of a predictive, you know, uh, ability over time. And so right now we have these springs that we adjust to create more pressures in the pad. And one of the things I'd like to do is have some springs that are quick change springs. You can pop them out and pop new ones in. And could we set it up exactly like Invisalign where you've got this series of springs that the, the patient's family can pop in and pop out. And obviously, you know, we want to be careful there and, and make sure it's uh, foolproof. Uh, you know, I've got to be careful because there's so many things I want to do as an engineer. Um, and and <laughs> get in trouble with Jamie where, you know, hey, well, from, from, <laughs> from a parent perspective, I kind of like the idea of the Invisalign in terms of, you know, how you can um, project out in two years or so what the outcome might be. And it's a much easier sell to your son or daughter as well in terms of, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and of course, as both of you know, compliance is a probably the number one factor in terms of uh, uh, bracing success. Uh, with these rigid braces behind me, uh, very tough compliance, right? What do you find the compliance like for the uh, whisper brace? Uh, you know, we are doing a separate clinical study, um, which we can talk limited about more on numbers and that. We can't release any data until a, a clinical study is done. Um, otherwise you can invalidate your data and not have it published. We have, I think, 10 or 12 patients outside the clinical study right now. And I can tell you with those patients, we're seeing definite increased uh, compliance. Most of those patients were wearing a regular brace before they went to ours. Um, and you can see it from day one, every patient that we put a brace on, if they're sitting, they do this forward bend and back and they kind of laugh. If you see on our website, that little girl is just typical or we call it, uh, they look like a weeble wobble. Every kid who's standing up 
ends up doing this kind of wobble and you can see their mind thinking, wow, I can use my core muscles. And that, that allowing them to have mobility, I think is the biggest factor in increasing compliance for these kids. They, they just don't feel like they're in a cocoon anymore. They feel like they can move. It's gonna be pretty good because it gets easier and easier wearing it. Like now I'm able to do pretty much anything and like I'm pretty used to it because I'm pretty active and it's easier to do a lot of stuff now. We quick, we spent a lot of time interviewing patients on what is the main factor that's, that's preventing compliance on these kids. And we saw the mobility was huge, um, breathing, eating, um, and temperature. So these kids, you know, if you have too tight a corset, it's hard to eat a full meal. You can't breathe as much. You're not using your muscles. Um, and so those all, and then if you're in a really warm, humid area, it can be, it can be pretty unbearable to wear a brace, especially in the summer. So we went into all those factors and we wanted to make sure those were being addressed in the brace. And we've seen that actually pay a, play a big factor in compliance for these kids. And then the other thing I'd add is, is Matt came up with a system for tracking compliance. We have a sensor on the brace and we originally did it so that the, the clinicians and the parents could see what the kids were doing because you know if you get a report card, you tend to do better in school. So we want to see that. The kids, once they're educated, they become engaged in their own care and they want to start showing their parents, hey, look at how many hours a day I'm wearing the brace. So that was another reinforcing factor that I think some studies from, I believe from TSRH showed that uh, Texas Scottish Rights showed that there was an increase in compliance with monitoring. I know we're going to see that with ours too. That just goes onto their phone, I guess. Apple yeah, on their phones. Yeah. yeah, it's connected to their phone and then Amazon Web Services hosts our back end and then it, it presents a display to the to the kids and the parents. One of my fears with wear, wearing a bracing long term is that you're going to end up with a lot of muscle atrophy. And, you know, that's the reason why if you're not weaned off a brace slowly, there's nothing to hold the curve once you take a brace off, right? Right. How does the whisper brace kind of solve or try to solve that particular issue? You can take that, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it, it's really interesting. I, I think if you look at uh, some of the work um, Noelle Larson at Mayo Clinic has done, she put uh, uh, some pedometers on scoliosis patients. And she, she followed a cohort of patients that were diagnosed with scoliosis but did not yet require treatment and tracked like how active they were. And then some of that cohort went into bracing and she saw the change. And so they went from an average of, it was something like 12 or 14,000 steps a day down. There was a dramatic drop once patients were braced. And so I think it's because you just can't be active in a rigid brace. You know, one of the things we learned when we were, you know, starting this out was you know, how much of an effect this has on, on the patient and their mobility. Like they can't tie their shoes on their own a lot of the time. Some, some can, you know, in, a, in some Rigo Chanos, some patients can tie their shoes, but a lot of them can't. Um, a, a lot of them, you know, so I think the limitation on, on motion is really leading to a lot of effects in their life, like muscular atrophy. And, and so having a flexible brace, our patients, you know, we had a, a patient she got so excited that she could pick up a pen that she dropped on the floor. And so the day after she got our race, she went to school and she ran over to her best friend and dropped a pen on the floor and said, look, look, she leaned over and picked it up. So I think that having that, that uh, uh, range of motion is going to keep these patients active. And you know we believe that they're going to retain that core strength as a result of it. So. You know, obviously we, we want data long-term, but we're certainly very hopeful that we're going to keep patients active and, and stave off muscular atrophy as much as possible. Yeah, I would add to that. We had uh, one mom tell us that her daughter had, had been in gymnastics and tumbling and had plateaued. She could only do like one back handspring and, and or maybe two, but that was it. And uh, uh, we'd given her the brace and the next time we saw her, she said, you know, she's now, you got to see this video. It's her daughter going all the way across the floor. And so, because if, if you're compliant, you're not using those muscles. And even though she goes to gymnastics practice, she wasn't using those muscles all day in the, in the brace. So she was able to actually move and she just, she felt so much stronger and, and it showed in her, her tumbling routine. 
Amy, you got a question for you. I was wondering if you could hold up the brace again for me. Sure. And what I, what, what I didn't know before was uh, with the upper uh, ring, and if you can again, push it back to the neutral, the top part. So. Yeah, so there's a constant, that's where the spring and, and the piston basically try to uh, correct the, uh, the curve at that level. Right. So th when the person moves in the brace, they have to kind of work against that pressure as well. Does that, is that part of the, um, the thought process or the engineering behind it? So the, the reality was, you know, we kind of stumbled into a lot of things about this brace that ended up being beneficial. Our initial theory was, hey, we want to sustain that, that you know, corrective force. And we weren't thinking like about range of motion and, and you know, retaining muscular tone and things like that. And we weren't thinking about breathability, you know, but all of this stuff sort of allows those things. Um, you know, the reality is that when the patient moves, when they bend over to tie their shoes, we're not going to get as effective a correction on that patient, but just for that transient event, we've got, you know, they're going to move. They can't stay, you know, hunched over like that. They're going to tire their muscles out relatively quickly fighting those sort of restorative forces. And so, yeah, there is some transient event where we're not likely to be as effective correcting the patient, but then, you know, they're right back to, to, you know, close to neutral, getting those corrective forces after they finish that transient move. So, um, you know, if we could uh, uh, adapt and keep it perfect, you know, with awesome correction, even when they're tying their shoes, that would be great. But uh, we don't. It's a transient event that's that's you know very short in duration, and they go back to neutral and and sort of getting those good corrective forces. Uh, Jamie, I was sorry to, if I we could go back a little bit to the data on the on the brace. I know you can't share too much because right. you're in the middle of a study, and I'll, and I'll validate the study if you do talk about it. But based upon those 10 or 12 patients that aren't in the study, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, compliance? Um, I know you've touched on it a little bit before in terms of how the, how the kids are doing. How has from those patients, what have you seen in terms of, uh, you know, embrace correction, not embrace correction, that type of thing? Yeah, we, uh, one of the, the family was on our website. Um, the father actually works in the spinal implant industry. So uh, for a big company and he, he reached out to us, his daughter got diagnosed with a 39 degree curve. And uh, after it was like six months or so when she did her follow-up x-ray, uh, she has a 39 lumbar and like 22 thoracic and her lumbar curve had already had like six degrees of correction and so had I can't remember what her thoracic was um, but she was not wearing her rigid brace uh, almost at all like just barely tolerating went to ours and she's been you know wearing it 18 hours a day ever since and she's over a year out now so we you know I, I know for sure on that one that we saw significant uh, improvement in compliance as well as uh, we saw we've actually seen some correction in her spine um, and we've seen that on some other ones too. That one's our, our big one because we, we know them personally and we followed them and he was adamant about, hey, let's, I want to do whatever I can to keep my daughter out of surgery. So, you know, there's one for sure that we have and Matt, I'm sure you can talk to some of the others. Uh, they don't always let me in with the patients, right? They love to <laughs> get in there and do it. They're like, you just stay in the office, but it's amazing when you do go in there. I think the, uh, the big thing that I noticed um, coming in and seeing some of these patients, I'd show up at this six month follow up or whatever um, outside of study, and some parents would pull me aside and say, You know, you've changed my relationship with my daughter. It used to be this antagonistic, antagonistic relationship. I was nagging her all the time, you gotta wear the brace, you gotta wear the brace. And now she just does. And so we have our own issues with a middle school teenage girl but it has nothing to do with the brace. It's on everything else that goes on in life. And so we can actually relate to each other a lot more. And we've heard that one over and over and over again. And, and I tell you that for me, that's just been some of the, the biggest rewards of this is having these parents just going like, okay, they're wearing it. And thank you for that. Cause it's not because I'm driving them through it. There are different kinds of braces. You know, there are braces that are kind of designed for nighttime. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bracing and others for daytime. There are even some um, centers that like to double brace, more of a you know a regal style for the day. 
than a nighttime brace with you know more correction or even over correction during the night. Uh, is it comfortable to sleep in the brace with you know the springs and, and the pistons and what kind of correction is there at night with this with the with the whisper brace as well? Can you speak to that, Matt? <laughs> sure. So it, it's uh, interesting. We just we've had most of our patients have been in a rigid brace and they've had no real issues moving to the whisper brace in terms of nighttime wear. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really interesting thing to look at. And one of the things we're excited about is that we do have the sensor system. And so we're going to be collecting more and more data as time goes on. And one of the things we're really interested in is what are the most effective times of wear? Um, because, you know, that's sort of critical. You, you look at the brace study and it says below about six hours of wear, um, six hours and below of brace wear, there was no difference with unbraced patients. And so, you know, that makes you kind of wonder like, well, what, where is that sort of cutoff? And, and one of the things we wonder about is, is nighttime wear actually effective because your, your body is prone and you don't have your body weight sort of exacerbating the curve. So, you know, you have this curve and you've got this body weight when you're standing upright that's pushing on the curve and it's, it's exacerbating and it's making it worse. And there's some studies out there that track, like there's actually a diurnal rhythm to scoliotic curves that curves are better in the morning and they get worse over the course of the day. And is that because they're unloaded during the night? And so I think it, it you know, in theory, it makes a lot of sense to have a brace that's more corrective at night because you're probably getting more bang for your buck out of that. And then having, you know, your daytime brace, which is going to be as much as you can tolerate when you're, when you're sort of awake and upright. Um, I suspect that nighttime wear in, a, in one brace, the same brace that you're wearing during the day, is not as effective. I'm, I, and I can't wait to get the data and, and find out if that's actually the case. Very good. Now, Jamie, um, in terms of uh, the whisper brace, you seem to have uh, some very, very respected uh, surgeons who are supporting your cause. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, we are very fortunate. And uh, I had been in the spinal implant world for 20 years before getting into uh, racing with Matt. And so, you know, I, I had been fortunate enough to meet many of them. And then once we, we got a proof of concept for Matt and we were, we were able to get a meeting at, at uh, one of the Scoliosis Research Society meetings. And we got this group of just world-renowned surgeons together. And we had a simple silicone slug with four plastic rings on it. And it was kind of big and bulky, but we talked all about bracing. And, and when we showed it to them and they played with it, they said, you know, the kids will be able to move. You guys are going to be able to generate the force. If you can actually make that thing into something kids will wear i know we would put it on all of our kids and like that night was just game changing for matt and i because we knew we had something we knew we had a lot of work to do but we knew we had something and then those surgeons started uh introducing us to other surgeons and it kind of went from there and i i can't thank them enough because we we definitely wouldn't have had the insights that we have now as far as treating scoliosis without them um and these are i mean these, many of these guys have been design team leaders for spinal implants at major companies, Medtronic, Stryker, J and J, but they're helping us keep kids out of surgery, which is we're eternally grateful for. I know it's basically design, and you try and do all the work, uh, both of you, on um, for adolescent bracing. But I kind of want to touch on a little bit of the adult bracing uh, because it seems to be, uh, unfortunately, very much a neglected demographic. And I know that you've had a, some adults who tried the brace. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Yeah, I, I would first say like we designed our whole website to help increase the education for parents and patients of adolescent uh, scoliosis patients. And we get a huge amount of traffic of adults who've been either living with AIS as adults or they have degenerative scoliosis. Um, and what we're also seeing is you know, as they get older, it's, it's a pain issue right? Like they've got muscle pain because they're, they're, they've got a curve, their muscles are stretched around the curve and it's affecting their quality of life. So we have three adult patients uh, who are very different. We have a, a 60 year old attorney wearing a brace. We have a 75 year old lady in Southern California wearing a brace. And we have a retired uh, kind of small rancher 
in rural California wearing the brace. And they all had kind of similar complaints about they weren't able to do their activities because of the pain in their spine. Um, and Matt and the engineering team has done an incredible job with them, uh, you know, being able to provide the support and let them, it, it has definitely increased their, their quality of life. Um, and I can tell you for uh, the attorney's perspective, we went to interview him and his secretary said, oh, you know, why are you interviewing him? I said, oh, I, I run the company that, he's, that makes the brace he's wearing. She said, oh, that thing. And I said, well, what's wrong with it? She's like, no, it's great. But if he forgets it, he's a bear to deal with. So we, I was like, well, that's, wow, that's actually a good, good thing. And he'll tell you, I'm in a, I'm in a pain level of a seven or eight when I'm not wearing the brace and I'm down to a one or two while wearing it. And he's wearing his brace 16 hours a day. I wear it when I drive. So I love to go hunting, uh, which is a five hour drive. If I'm not wearing the brace, I pay the price. If I am wearing the brace, I walk out, I feel great. I go fishing. I have four or five hour drives, same thing. I go mountain biking. I put it on right after I'm done and you know the hour drive home from the mountain biking I'm so much more comfortable and when I get home I'm so much <laughs> I guess more pain-free uh, bad language but the point is um, it gives you freedom yeah it's a brace but it gives you the freedom to enjoy life as an adult that you wouldn't otherwise have um, without this technology because quite frankly I don't know that I would have worn the solid braces. Um, with this one, it really is easy to wear and it really uh, creates a pain-free environment for me um, because going from a seven or an eight down to a one or a two is life-changing. That's all you can say. I mean, it, yeah, is there any pain? Sure, but a one to two is nothing after you've been at a seven or eight, so. So we know that was always our long-term. We wanted to prove it on kids, expand out with kids and then get into adults. We've dabbled just to make sure, you know, we can do it with that and, and kind of see a bigger market and, and see if we can gain any insights about things we could also provide for the kids. Matt, for, if you go to the adult racing, uh, is it the same engineering principles as you apply to scoliosis? And for, because you can't, you know, really correct the curve. So how do you, how do you engineer for an adult, uh, uh, you know, patient versus an adolescent patient? patient with a whisper brace? Yeah, it's a great and interesting question. And we're, we're finding out as we go along. I think that uh, when you, when you, you know, there is this assumption that you can't uh, do anything about an adult degenerative curve. And, and that may be true, but it may not be. I mean, we, we'd love to try. Um, the body's still adapting. When you look at old people who, who auto-fuse you know, they're following Wolf's Law as the bone sort of grows around the disc space. You know, their, their body is adapting to a desiccated disc. And so can we get their body to adapt by putting, you know, the right forces in the right places on their spine? So I'd like to leave the door open to that, even though it may not, it's, it's just a crack. <laughs> that, that said, most of their problems are, are symptomatic, whereas most adolescent, adolescent patients, they're not, they're not in pain. Some of them are. But most of them are not. Most of them just have the scoliotic curve and we're trying to stave off the worst effects of the disease in the future. And so you're not really looking for symptomatic relief at all with an adolescent patient. And that's what you're looking at. That's mostly what you're looking at with an adult patient. So even if we can't improve their curve, can we improve their quality of life? So far, we've kind of hit it out of the park with the three patients we have who, who have have had dramatic changes in their quality of life and their ability to do things. Uh, and I think that when you look at the adult patient, there's a whole slew of things that you need to consider because their, their skin tone is not what you're going to see in, a, in an adolescent patient. So we're more concerned about development of lesions and they might have osteoporosis. And so we need to be careful about exactly how much we're pushing on them. So there's a lot of considerations. We wanna do things the right way and we need to stay focused on adolescents for now. But I think with the adolescent brace, there's certainly a, a section of that, you know, adult degenerative population that we could certainly help out. And, you know, we're all, out, all about helping out as many people as we can. It's kind of why we got into doing this. So we'd, we'd love to continue that, but stay focused on adolescents for sure. Yep. From the ground up. Jamie, question for you. Uh, where 
do you see the Whisper Braves headed? I know it's your it's already um, being launched now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you or where you see the Whisper Braves in a year or two, five years, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, our our goal from day one, our mission was we want to significantly improve the patient experience while wearing a brace. And if we're if we do that, we're going to keep these kids out of surgery. The studies show it's it's all based on compliance, and and we're starting to hit that now. Um, in the future, it, you know, what we're seeing the next couple of years is we're going to expand out, be working with and providing this uh, through orthotists and, and physicians all throughout the country. We want patients not to have to travel to a clinical site and get on a plane and go a thousand miles. We want to be able to offer this to kids all over the place. We're going to be able to do that. And we're not stopping until this is the standard of care for treatment. There's been, this space has been neglected for way too long and we're going to get there. It's not going to take that many years until we're there. Well, if there are parents or patients who are interested in uh, information regarding the whisper brace should they just contact you through the website or is that yes, the best um, pathway the easiest way is to go onto the website it's just greensunmedical.com and you'll see the whisper brace page and there's a contact form if you want information and we can help provide you or uh, give you the information to guide you to a provider that's offering the whisper brace okay terrific uh just as in closing i don't know if if uh, both of you just want to say a few ending uh, comments and then take it from there. I just, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, I'd like to thank everybody, the, the orthodists, especially, and the, the surgeons who work with us to help make our brace better and, and get this on patients. Um, I'm really just honored with all the help that we've received and, and uh, to have the ability, you know, we've had a couple of patients write us some letters that say, you've really changed my life. And, you know, that's really amazingly touching and that's why we got into this. And so I just want to express our gratitude for all the people that have helped get us there. The orthodists and the surgeons we've worked with, uh, you know, Lori Dolan, who helped us put our clinical study together and, you know, snaps us in line. Um, just really want to thank all those people for this opportunity. Great comments. And I, I just wanted to uh, throw in there that sometimes it's, it seems that it's difficult to change uh, something as simple as the type of brace that an orthodist makes, um, you know, if they've been doing that for five years, 10 years, that type of thing. And the same is true for surgeons who are kind of into their own groove. So it's pretty interesting that for me anyway, and just uh, speaking to surgeons myself, that they're willing to, to give you guys input and to help you out. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, we've been very lucky with them. But if you look at those surgeons, there's been this huge movement towards vertebral body tethering, right? And non-fusion surgical treatments of scoliosis. And that has really started to come to a head and patients and parents are demanding it. At least they want to know if that's an option or not for their kids. Um, we know that's going to happen with us because the parents are, are wanting to see something that's even non-operative. And I can't, I can't uh, expand on what Matt said anymore. Like we're so grateful for the for these surgeons who are providing, you know, trying to push their patients towards something to keep them out of surgery instead of just signing them up for surgery. So we know we're going down that road as far as growth modulation, and, and we're very grateful to those guys for helping us. Excellent. Well, again, once again, thank you, Matt and Jamie, for your time, and I'm looking forward to what the whisper brace can do in the future and what your studies are going to say for sure. You know, I, I should say we should thank you too. I mean, I think it's great that a parent has taken it on himself who's, who watched his son go through these treatments and reached out to all of these surgeons and orthotists and providers and, and tried to educate the, the parents and the patients. I think, uh, you know, hats off to you for going through all of this and, and helping all of these uh, families out because I know you get viewers from all over the world, not just the U.S. So I think we should be thanking you also. For sure. Uh, Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Have a terrific day. And Thank you. Uh, we'll follow up soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you.